Good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for today's uh, Perspectives on Energy. And today we'll talk about broadband for all and uh, some discussions on how that's coming about. All right. Uh, I'm Guillermo Sabatier, your host, and I'm also the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute. And I'm also your host for Perspectives on Energy here on ThinkTech Hawaii. So thank you for joining us. Uh, today we'll be discussing the... Uh, the Build Back Better plan the and how, for example, more rural communities and smaller utilities that are now, for example, investor-owned or the larger uh, entities, we'll talk about how how smaller com- remote communities like those uh, that are supplied by electrical co-ops, municipalities, uh, there, there's a plan in place that gives them exemptions on uh, bring, uh, putting out fiber and broadband communications infrastructure on their utility poles and on the spans, right? So uh, some more of that. And uh, which, which sounds like great news for those of us that are living in remote locations or those of us looking to perhaps uh, relocate to some areas, you know, that were at some point, you know, uh, remote and the cost of living was a lot lower, but we're limited by the uh, internet connectivity. So uh, when it comes to remote work or being able to work remotely in that case, you know, we're often dependent on the availability of high spe- high speed internet. So some of these other HughesNet or e- even the one from um, Starlink, for example, is great, but there's a strong, there's a hard limit on the upload speeds and availability, whereas this presents a whole new opportunity, right? For the customers or as the co-ops call them, the members. And uh, world of opportunity. So, so let's dive right in. So one of the things that um, last week I was at uh, in Tennessee uh, delivering some training and uh, had a chance to meet a great a great bunch of people from the um, all the electric co-ops and municipalities in that area. And I was delivering a class on system operations. Uh, it was for to, to the, getting familiar to the transmission side of the business. And uh, for them, uh, looking at it from a distribution from a di- distribution perspective. So one of the things that we've known for a while, right? They've had, for example, um, ever since they signed the whole Build Back Better program, the Farms Bill, and even the Broadband Equity Access Program, for example, those to name a few. So uh, how does that work, and what's been happening, right? So, so namely, that's been driven by the policy shifts in Washington D.C. Namely, when they began to build that whole Build Back Better program which had to do with the whole broadband for all part of that plan, right? And, and some of that was, of course, to make sure that you brought the ability of high-speed connectivity to every corner of the country. So nobody would basically be out of access as long as they had electric service. So if you have electric service anywhere you're at, there's a pretty soon you're also going to have a broadband or high-speed internet or fiber optic available to you, right? Which is great news from the perspective of, um, of uh, using with not even streaming but actually being able to do uh, access schooling access remote education even for example uh being able to get to work right from a, from a remote uh, location perspective so as it is today for example with most um, electric co-ops and municipalities uh, there are about 900 of them, at least co-ops in this country but most of those co-ops serve the rural or remote locations and we have a plenty of those in this large vast country so out of those, uh, apparently there's 900 of those, right? I think I mentioned earlier. Out of those 900, about 200 of those have already run, uh, effectively run fiber optic cabling uh, throughout their system. So what does that mean, right? And this has only been in a matter of maybe less than two years. So, and the pace is accelerating. So so uh, one of the estimates are that within maybe three to four years, you're going to see all, all of that completed and if not done faster. So it's great news for 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 their members. Great news for the rest of us that decide to move into these these communities right there that are you know beautiful communities, a little bit more remote. But we were often um, uh, put off by the idea that you know moving there would mean you you uh, you don't have a lot of connectivity. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't have a lot of like cell phone coverage anyway. So um, now with this um, with this availability of broadband, pretty much anywhere there's power, it's going to be a great. Um, great opportunity uh, especially when, when it comes to looking for affordable housing and um, getting away from the uh, cities and suburbs and and all those areas that that for most people have become quite out of reach right so how is this being done right and so right, right now it just there's a there's 65 billion dollars available for some of these co-ops that they can access up front 
to be able to do this work, which wasn't always the case. So uh, one of the things that they, they have is a lot of exemptions for them to be able to like um, place that fiber optic uh, cabling, right, on their facilities. Normally in the most uh, distribution, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in most distribution facilities, whether it's you have, for example, a pole that's about 30 feet tall, between 20 and 30 feet tall, sometimes higher, um, you're going to have the very top as a primary conductor that can be anywhere between from 4 kV all the way up to like maybe 20, 33 kV in some cases, but for the most part, usually around 13 kV, um, 13,000 volts. I see. So what happens there normally is that, you know, like the, you, you, that's called the primary. Usually that connects to a transformer, a, a pole top transformer that's usually sh- shaped like a large can that sits on the pole that gets stepped down. Then you have your secondary voltage. It's usually three wires. Two of them are hot, one's a neutral. And that runs uh, in parallel with those primary wires. But those are about the four feet beneath, as per code, that primary wire, right? So those are the usual, that is usually what uh, the feed to your house gets tapped from. And then, then you have, for example, that which is called the secondary. That secondary, usually it's a 120, 120, and then a neutral that comes down to your service drop. And that's what basically supplies your house. Uh, maybe a couple of feet beneath that is usually what you see for uh, slated for communications. That space is where communications workers get up there and they either they use a string copper for uh, phone circuits, then it was cable, and then lately it's been mostly um, uh, multi, multi-stranded multi uh, fiber optic uh, with cladded in vinyl or, or, or polyester, right? And then with a self-supporting strand, right? And, th- and that's been the case in, you know, pretty much everywhere across the industry, right? And in a lot of cases, that that's something that the utilities never got involved in, electric utilities never got involved in, right? And for the most part, that was something just that the uh, communications workers, you know, union were the ones that would handle that, whether it was phone or it was cable or internet. Now, um, as far as the federal exemptions go right now, it seems like the uh, electrical co-ops are themselves striking up this uh, fiber optic telecom wire up next to where you have the primary uh, conductors. So that means that only a qualified line worker can get up there and do this work. So that pretty much puts it out of reach. For some of these like um, communications or technicians or some of the folks that work for you, the phone company, the cable company, they won't be able to reach it anymore. It presents a, an interesting challenge, right? Because th- this this exemption allows these uh, co-ops and municipalities to operate in you know with that particular type of uh, infrastructure and then hang it up there on the poles, right? So for them, it's it's now a whole new added um, field of work that's potentially outside of the scope when it comes to uh, the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, now you're adding that to their scope. So it's kind of an interesting exception, but that with with the co-ops, specifically rural co-ops and municipalities, that's something that they're enjoying very well. And um, ideally, this this facilitates a process of uh, of uh, hanging this wire you know, uh, right along with, with the same spans of conductor that you see out there in these rural communities. The benefit of that of course, is that now, um, as I said before, uh, most of their customers or members, as they call them, right, are going to also experience the benefit of having communications as part of their service package. Right Now, uh, most of these co-ops haven't quite been in the business of cabling or broadband or internet yet, but, it's, but it seems like a lot of them are going to be getting into that. So uh, in some cases, others may not. They may just pretty much install the the fiber up there and then lease those fiber lines out to the local cable company or the broadband company. And then whenever work needs to be done physically on on those lines, then it's the the utility or rather the co-op that goes up there with a qualified uh, line worker to do some work on that or bring the actual bundle down for the communications worker to work on there. So I, I myself have worked on fiber optic cables when, um, decades ago, and, and usually you, you don't work on that up there. You usually bring the actual bundle down, you unwind it, and then you work on that pretty much at ground level. Or in the best case scenario, you bring the bundle into a nicely air-conditioned van where you get to work on that, open up that uh, that encasement, work on the fiber, do some splicing, close it, test it, close it up again, and then have somebody else uh uh, wrap it up and put it up in, on the pole for you because you're not going to get up there and do it yourself. But that's probably most likely how that's going to work when it comes to the, the, uh, the technical aspect of working on that on those facilities. 
Um, but that's from the from okay the early fee feasibility aspect, right? Uh, at the rate this is going, it seems like like it, it'll progress rather quick. One of the, one of the other things that I think uh, from a business standpoint, right? Uh, most communities now will be able to enjoy quite a, I mean, I mean, so many different opportunities. And the way I see it, you have a remote customer who's now able to do, for example, now they can actually engage in a different level of business, right? When it comes to uh, internet connectivity, uh, m- making services available online, uh, being able to respond rather quickly and, or, or even do some light broadcast. Uh, for example, this I'm doing right now, I live in a suburban center, right? Which very high speed internet. But for example, if I were to move somewhere else, uh, say in the mountains somewhere of uh, in, in South or North Carolina, in some cases, right, that may not be as available, especially if I decided to you know build build somewhere that's away from the uh, from primary service, right. But with this, it seems like it, it's it's you're you're going to have a greater level of reach when it comes to accessing real estate that now has uh, this high speed internet attached to it, which is great news for for, for many of us. The other thing, of course, is um, for the utility itself, or rather the co-op itself, this becomes a great revenue generator, right? Uh, as long as as long as the feasibility is done right, you know, the due diligence is done, is done well, uh, the these co-ops can really either make a lot of profit on the on the leasing, right, of these uh, fiber optic facilities. Now, myself coming from the transmission side, we've had decades of experience dealing with. Um, fiber optic up on the uh, static wire or 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 maybe in the in uh, above the conductor right so that, that static wire usually is is a, is like a, a, a new or cladding surrounding a this bundle of uh of fiber optic uh, fiber optic strands now uh, so there you'd have anywhere between 20 to 40 different um fiber optic individual fiber optic strands that you can then for example le- use and lease out you have spares in a lot of cases, we only be using four or five of them, and uh, especially for the corporate network, we use them a lot for uh, transmission line relaying communications, right? But and but then in other cases, you know, a, a lot of those lines could be uh, leased out to the local telecom or local cable, which which would the utility used to work for did that and did that to great effect and a great level of profit. So um, and that also benefited a lot of the communities they served. So bring this down to the distribution level, now you have a lot more reach with a lot more possibilities. And one thing that really comes to mind, number one is uh, j- besides a revenue generator for these uh, co-ops in these municipalities, you also have the great possibility now of really taking advantage of all the smart devices, especially for the utility, right? Smart meters, smart switches, smart telemetry. Um, uh, even, for example, the information that comes to the substations to and from station security, which is another thing that we're concerned with now, right? So substation security has been an issue in the past. And one of the things that we saw recently, right, these, these attacks and some of these substations, well, there wasn't enough bandwidth to be able to like send back, for example, real-time information as far as intrusion in the area or people approaching some of these like facilities because they're so remote. Uh, now with this broadband, for example, uh, especially at, the, at a distribution circuit, you can definitely make that um, available. And uh, and I'm sure you know th- this probably goes from the distribution station back up the transmission. So a lot a lot more fiber availability means a lot more communications and a lot more um, control and monitoring of some of these devices. So the other interesting thing as well is that uh, just the restoring from a fault, right? When you have, for example, these like uh, they call them the SNC. Uh, trip savers, which is a, a, a rather than having a fuse for a lateral uh, primary out in the field, now you have a trip saver, which means now you can actually communicate, change settings uh, without the need of having to do something wireless, right? And now you, now you have a, an actual fiber optic that, that will be present whether or not you have power in that line or not. So that's another great advantage. So now you can actually communicate with these devices in the field, change settings, uh, figure out where the outage is, restore quickly, and uh, send that information back. Another important thing here as well is, is even like, for example, um, vegetation management is another great possibility. Uh, also, for example, uh, wildfire, uh, storms, winter icing, all that can is can be greatly uh, mitigated or, or, or fiber optic communication has a great role in controlling that particular exposure to outages. Um, and, and the list goes on. I mean, it, it just I can't just talk about it in just half an hour because there's so many opportunities here. Now, from a consumer or rather a, a, a member, for example, um, 
benefit. Of course, you know, just just having high speed internet in an area that you w- would not normally have been available, you you would be basically stuck dealing with uh, uh, satellite satellite internet, which is not always the quickest thing, especially uploads. But with fiber, that that changes the game completely. So what does what could this do, right? Uh, this ideally could basically open up the real estate market anywhere for anyone if they were interested in doing remote work, or at least having that connectivity where they can now have access to this particular uh, resource. The, and it doesn't matter where you build your home, right? You can actually have that as long as you have power, which which is great news. And so for me, that's something that I would personally really take advantage of if that if, you know, if that becomes available soon in an area that that I would be interested in buying it. So the other interesting benefit there is is small businesses. Uh, now you can actually um, in certain areas you can operate a small business with uh, greater efficiency, greater connectivity, and even greater greater. Um, um, reliability, uh, specifically when you're putting orders online in that case, right? So now you can actually launch a bigger, more intricate websites, or even, for example, certain videos, you can do live streaming videos of your products, and the list goes on and on, right? And so, so this, of course, can attract a lot of uh, a lot of like small business. The other interesting thing here as well is that you can also look at the fact that this can also uh, bring, attract additional industrial commercial accounts to an area where it would pretty much would not, e- would not have even been considered based on the fact that there was no connectivity available. They may have had power, but connectivity was a factor that that required them to, uh, or rather it was a deal breaker if that wasn't available. So now more areas are going to have additional opportunities to actually engage in business. Uh, a, great, a greater deal of tax revenue for, for the community, a greater deal of revenue for the utility or the co-op because now they can sell power to a customer, a commercial, industrial customer that normally would have gone somewhere else to do this. So again, another advantage in this regard, right? And then finally, of course, is uh, the thing that I always look at is the fact that uh, you never know what's going to happen again. You can do remote schooling as well, right? So whenever you do remote schooling, this becomes another definite advantage where it's, where it's like some of the folks in the uh, more rural remote areas were often lagging behind compared to the uh, to their peers and in, in, in classes that were closer to to the city or town centers because they had better connectivity. So when it came to like a live stream class uh, that would stream both ways, oftentimes that they were not able to actually engage or participate in the level that they could have had because of the fact that they didn't have the high speed internet available. So how does this, uh, from a utility perspective, right? Uh, just looking at the fact that, you know, th- this can really, really change the game when it comes to uh, just as I said earlier, the smart devices really make the grid more, more reliable. And finally, of course, the idea of a distributed energy resources, right? As some of these folks out there in these remote sites tend to like to put solar panels up, they may do a micro hydro, depending on the, on the geography and the water availability. They may do, they may have an electric vehicle, uh, especially if they live in some of these remote areas that they can charge from, from a solar panel. I've been to different facilities where you have, for example, several acres where they actually put one acre of that in solar panels. And right now we're at a point where one acre of, of uh, solar panel s- surface area equals to about one megawatt, one million watts of power availability, right? So that's a definite uh, huge advantage in that case. So with all that power going back up to the distribution network, having uh, connectivity and having uh, communications at the speed of fiber becomes even more important right? because now the utilities or the co-ops may, may want to redispatch, for example, these resources. More so if you have behind the meter uh, storage, like a battery bank, electric vehicles, or even any other device might be storing energy. And like a perfect example of that would be like a micro pump storage site. Uh, Somebody has a water source and they have enough head, they can actually build a reservoir on both sides that they can pump water up and down. And actually that generates uh, a small amount of electricity for for that regard. But for most people, they have enough of that uh, resource, they can probably run a a whole house on a micro hydro micro hydro um, uh, site. So, Again, storing storing energy becomes important. This is a, a really from the dispatchability or resource management from the utilities. Uh, again, uh, this kind of wouldn't be possible without high speed communications to be able to actually send the command, understand what's happening, monitor the uh, capability, availability, and dispatchability of some of these resources, and then being able to send the control. Uh, that wouldn't be possible uh, with with very slow slow satellite communications. It's way better served by some of this high speed fiber. So again, this is a, uh, to me is, is is a great development, and uh, and, and just for the fact that uh, 
earlier I touched on the idea of um, reliability and security in a substation, but also the fact that pretty soon we're going to going to have a lot of uh, small modular reactors deployed throughout the country, and these are usually going to be uh, um, sites with no remote sites with no personnel on them. It's just going to be a site that's going to be sealed, secured, and then several layers of uh, of uh, gates around them, fencing perhaps, maybe even underground. So I, ideally, securing a site requires a, a constant monitoring and constant constant alarming. So, and so easier to do with uh, fiber. That's uh, somehow cutting to that. Uh, I know for I know for some of these sites, usually satellite communications is available, but not always as quick as you have fiber. Right. Uh, also, the other thing about dispatchability, being able to send pulses back and forth to these devices, these uh, SMRs are going to be uh, really reliant on having quick communications, something not quite possible with satellite phones or satellite communications, but very feasible with fiber. So that's another definitely added advantage and uh, will 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 very cohesive in the sense that what's coming now with these SMRs will, will blend very well with this um, distribution level fiber optic communications that we're going to see being deployed in the next few years, pretty much everywhere. So I, again, I'm really enthusiastic about this. I really look forward to it. Uh, more to come on that. And uh, there, and I think I should be able to have a, a guest pretty soon uh, that would be discussing that from the different um, co-ops can get a little further on this show. So uh, again, thank you so much and uh, tune in pretty soon uh, for my next episode on, on this discussion. Um, and uh, definitely great news in this regard when it comes to uh, re- remote or rural customers uh, served by uh, co-ops and municipalities. Thank you again and have a wonderful uh, weekend. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.